everyone. We're so glad that you guys are here from all over the country and world. It's great to see where you guys are coming in from. I'm here with my friend Holly Goddard, and she is the Director of Ministry Environments at North Point Community Church. Holly, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Holly, just to get us started, I know um, I mentioned what your title is, but that really doesn't tell us what you actually do. Can you just give us a little bit of background of um, how long have you been at North Point and what have you been doing and what are you doing now? Sure. Yeah, I'm about to celebrate 10 years here with North Point Ministries, and I have done a, a merry-go-round of jobs. I started in uh, Wombaland and was the director of Wombaland here at North Point, and then went to one of our other campuses and worked as um, director of married groups and director of starting point. So got to do both of those ministries before coming back to North Point. And then when Andy uh, came back down two years ago to serve as lead pastor, I moved into this role, which is over uh, ministry environments, which really just oversees the day-to-day of family and adult ministries. Yeah, absolutely. And really, Holly is kind of leading the charge of this whole new strategy that we've been talking about behind the scenes alongside of Andy and really kind of making it practical. So, Holly, I'm so glad that you're here today to talk to us about that. Um, like I mentioned, you were t- you have been leading, Andy's kind of asked you to lead a collaborative effort on throughout our campuses and across the board in our in our organization to kind of rethink our strategy. But can you give us before we dive into actually what that looks like, I'd love for you to just back up a minute and tell us what were you seeing or experiencing that even led uh, to this even being a need um, for now? Yeah, that's a great question, because you certainly don't go on an endeavor like this before you can clearly define the problem. And, and so what we had stumbled upon was The problem to solve was that uh, our strategic language that we had used for so long had lapsed. And many of you, if you've been around for for a while, you remember when we used to use the metaphor for your living room kitchen. And the brilliance of that metaphor is it really, without many words, could explain how you would interact with a guest uh, or an attendee based on where they were on the journey. And so that, that grid and framework just was so helpful for so many years because it was just a grid through which we could make decisions. Well, over time and kind of life cycle of an organization, some of that language began to lapse, but I believe it's because really the the infusion of all the digital church stuff, because this uh, pathway was really created when the church was purely physical. You know, the foyer was the literal front door. And so as digital just started to be more and more prevalent, we found ourselves not kind of uh, being able to use this metaphor like we could, you know, we'd be using language like, you know, it's kind of like when you're here or there. And so we decided it is time uh, to, to get a new language, a new framework, because church uh, will no longer only be purely physical. It's always going to be physical and digital going forward, this hybrid, this sort of joint venture. And so how could we talk about that in a way that the whole staff, and this is internal language, would know um, what we were trying to do based on where the person is on their journey. That's so great. I remember um, you and Andy both talking um, in the past about this whole idea of baristas versus uh, Mm -hmm. missionaries. Can you just unpack that a little bit for us? What were we, you know, how was, how was it that we were, you know, maybe operating as baristas and then what versus what we're thinking about now? Sure. Well, I think, you know, the last 25 years of of the church and especially of North Point, it's like, wow, this has been the the best hot dog stand in town. You know, this was a, uh, this was not your mom's church. You could come here and experience something different. And so we would just open up the doors and people would come in and we would just serve up ministry straight to them. Uh, But as the world and the culture has shifted, you know, church in a post-Christian, in a post-modern world, it is not on the forefront of people's minds um, like it has been so much in the past. So we have realized that people's journey towards God is going to start outside the walls of our church. And so we need to uh, act more like, think more like missionaries and find ourselves going to them, whether that means in the community or in the web, you know, worldwide web, wherever they may be, we need to meet them there. Yeah, that's so interesting. I know um, in the past, we used to have this phrase saying that Uh, the message begins in the parking lot. And what we now know is that the message begins way before they ever even enter anywhere near our premises. It's so true. You know, data tells us they'll check us out, you know, seven, eight, nine times before they would even consider uh, coming to a church. And so we know that that that's where their journey starts. So we want to be there. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I know Andy, um, some of our listeners were listening into it. We did an interview with Andy a few weeks ago, and he actually explained some about this, the language around our new strategy. So, um, but for those who may not have heard that, I'd love for, if you don't mind taking a couple minutes, just to kind of explain what is the new strategy that we're talking about. And I'm going to put up a slide while you do that. Sure. Absolutely. Well, the, the new language we've landed on is endear your community, inspire your audience, and equip your core. And underneath each of those, we have a mandate statement that we want to be true when this happens. So again, endear your community. The first thing that happens um, as people consider following Jesus is they begin to trust a Christian. You know, time and time again, we just hear that in people's story. You know, I didn't believe what they believe, but there was something different about that person. Or I met so-and-so at work and they were just different. They had something I didn't have. And we know that this journey for people begins by building trust. And as a church, we want to build trust. So that is why this first phase of the journey, it is purely outward focused. We just want to add value just to add value and just to love on people. So here's what we say. We say we want to ensure people know that we're here, are happy that we're here, and are better off because we're here. We want them to be glad that this church is in their community. And then when you move down the funnel a little bit uh, to inspire your audience, you know, that's what we've done really well, I think, for, for 25 years. You know, it's our Sunday morning environments. It's this rules of engagement that we use really in every environment from babies all the way up to adults, we want to create compelling experiences with helpful and practical information so that people can apply it to their lives. And so the way that, that we kind of uh, use this grid now is we say we want to create experiences that cause people to say, I'm glad I came and I can't wait to come back. We want them thinking about next time. And then, you know, lastly, this isn't a brand new thought either. Really, I think we've just elevated the importance of the core. So equip your core is really about the people that we lock arms with every week to make this happen. You know, um, just like every church in the world, we run on an army of volunteers that do this in their free time. And so we want them to be really, really equipped. So it isn't just enlisting and training, and it is that, but we want them to live a lifestyle of giving and leading and inviting. We want them to be so on mission with what we're doing that they can't help but, but bring others in to the life and the mission of our church. Yeah, that is so great. And I love that you said, I, um, my favorite thing that you just said about that equip por- portion is the whole idea is this is not new. We've just elevated the importance of it and brought it to the forefront of our staff's mind. I think that's so important. Um, Holly, right above the endear, inspire, equip on this diagram, there's three other words. Can you just talk to us a little bit, unpack why do we have those three other words and you know how it, how it works to like say, how does love work to endear our community? Yeah, that's, I think if you remember nothing else, you know, love, connect, and involve. That's what we want for people as they begin to follow Jesus. And, and really every relationship, it starts with love, just offering something to someone with no expectation in return. And we want to do that for our community, just to love them really just because Jesus loved us first. And so we really believe that's the foundation, but then we want to connect them and, and connect, not just Uh, We have a lot of people here. We have a big city. We live in a big city, big community, but we want people to feel known and we want the connections to be really personal. And so that's kind of the heartbeat of that connect. And then involve, we want to invite people into this journey, no matter where they find themselves. And so we want to figure out how to make them and integrate them into the life and the mission. That's awesome. Well, thank you for going over our strategy a little bit um, more in depth for those of the, for some of those that are listening, it's probably their first time hearing that. So I really appreciate that. Um, Let's get a little bit more practical. And now we know what it is. Let's, let's figure out like, so when we say endear, give us some practical examples of how at North Point Community Church, we are trying to put that in action and make that happen with boots on the ground in our community. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, we had a little something to, to build. Well, not a little something. We had a big something to build off of, you know, once a year, we for years, we've done a campaign called Be Rich. And the whole heartbeat of Be Rich is we are going to give, serve, and love our community. Again, nothing in return. Every dollar goes out. We put people out into um, the whole community just to serve and to make it a better place. And so really, we, we said, how can we do that more often? 
you know, and more systemically. And so we pulled together a group of, of people who cross-functional, lots of different departments, and kind of made a little work group. And we asked ourselves a couple of questions. Um, in this endear space, in this space of we want them to know we're here and we want to add value, what do we need to invent? Like, what are, what do we need to do that we're not even doing yet? Right. Uh, what do we need to leverage? You know, we have some great things that we're doing, but how can we talk about them in a new way so that maybe it invites some new folks in? And then uh, who do we partner with? Which has kind of always been our lens that we've looked through. We do not pioneer everything. We do not try to be the best of everything. There are so many great nonprofits around us. So we just want to come alongside and put wind in their sails. And so we just ask, um, who do we partner with? And how can we do that more often? Yeah, that's so important. When we talk about, I love that whole concept of partnering rather than pioneering because, you know, there are so many great um, organizations doing so many great things. And if we can find them and just partner with them, then both organizations get better in my mind. Um, So practically, Holly, I know that maybe talk about, I know we did a a recent bike drive. Um, Tell us a little bit about that bike drive. Where did that need come from and how did the church um, set out to endear our community through that effort. Sure. Yeah, that was actually, that's a great example of how we answered, you know, who do we partner with over COVID? We had partnered with our school system, which this relationship had been several years in the works, but over time we kind of just earned their trust because a lot of times the school systems are a little skeptical to get involved with, with churches and they want to keep it separate. Um, but, uh, over COVID there was a big deficit of books. And so our the attendees just stepped up and gave just so fantastically. So um, as we're heading into summer, we went back to them and said, hey, is there anything that you guys need? And they said, believe it or not, this is going to sound strange, but we have so many children that do not have bikes. They're from lower income families. They're stuck at home a lot over the summer. And we get so many requests through the school system for bicycles. And that's just not something we do. Like, would that be something you would be willing to take on? And so our intersect um, director, which that's the department that we have here that, that works with nonprofits. She just figured out how we're going to have a bike drive. Never done a bike drive before, but essentially we invited our attendees to bring, um, they could be used or new light dust, light rust, <laughs> you know, um, lights yeah. to the church. We collected them over a week and our staff, we were really praying for like 500 bicycles. We don't know how many that we could possibly get. We went, right. You, you go around and we, we went out to um, some of the businesses that we had partnered with before and said, Hey, do y'all want to be a partner and a couple bike shops in town? Could we use some mechanics and really kind of made it a community effort. And the people of this community showed up so big. It was incredible. They gave 1,200 bikes to the students of Fulton County Schools, which is really just mind blowing. And um, so that was just an incredible win, really. And it and we didn't even know uh, what to do. We had to go ask what would be helpful. Oh, that's so good. Are there any ideas that you're thinking about for the future that, you know, some new ideas that we might see coming up in the future of how we're going to endear our community that you guys are yeah, that's- on? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're trying to, we're thinking about that all the time. You know, I'll give you another example in the digital space. We're trying to, to figure that out because it is so easy to share a piece of helpful content with a friend. And so actually, you know, right now we just released something called Parent Summit uh, a couple of days ago. Yes. And so the same idea we learned um, during COVID that some of our parents were struggling being home with their kids all day. So we thought, let's tee up some great content to them to help them unpack parenting. And when we did, they sort of organically shared it with their friends and we began to meet so many new people. And so we said, we need to do that again. And we need to think of other spaces that we can meet people and just serve them up content that would be helpful, but hopefully starts their journey of following Jesus. So you're going to see things of like leadership labs um, for business organizations. And we're working on a couple of marriage and parenting things right now. Oh, that's so fascinating. Yes. That um, parent summit, um, by the way, if you're a partner listening today, that parent summit summit content is on the partner site and you guys can get that and put it up on, um, utilize it throughout your own churches as well. So it's super exciting. What about, um, as we move over to inspire your audience, I know Holly, you already mentioned that this is kind of what we've already been doing. It's kind of our Sunday morning experience. 
Is there anything new that we're thinking about in that space in terms of inspiring our audience? Um, when you think about how do we do that? And also on the digital space, like we have two audiences in a sense now. So how are we uh, inspiring our audience in those two areas? Yeah, great question. So, well, we recognize we had a couple of holes, you know, what do we need to invent? What are we not doing? And one hole here at North Point was that we really had a gap with the young adult audience. You know, we kind of threw that out and then it kind of picks back up when you're a Wombly and parent. And one thing is we don't have a college really close, but the truth is we have a lot of young adults in this community. We just didn't have something we're offering. So we basically said, you know, those of us who aren't in that space, we need to kind of get out of the way and and invite some of our residents and some of our people in their 20s and early 30s to figure out what does this group of people want and how can we serve them. So that is an area um, that is several months in and is picking up momentum, but that's a group that's beginning to meet here a couple times, sometimes outside on the lawn, sometimes in some different spaces, variety of things, but they're just trying some things out in that space. Uh, Another thing that we learned, and this was forced by COVID, we are lucky enough to have a couple acres of grass out in front of our building and we could not come inside, but we could socially distance and provide some pretty good experiences on the lawn. And we found just that we had the ability to create great family type events, you know, a whole experience that my son who's five came and enjoyed. And then I'm able to bring my unchurched, you know, family member. And and we did a Christmas tree lighting on the lawn last December. And that was such a hit because experiencing that with your family, is just creates such a bond and it adds so much value to our community. So like, those are a couple things that we want to keep doing and we wouldn't have stumbled onto, you know, without these circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. I heard you mention even today, um, that 4th of July, we're going to have a big, um, you know, if, uh, services on the lawn as well. So just another way to like, and, in, you know, endear our audience or our community and inspire our audience by just offering something new. I love that. Yeah, it's exciting. All right, so equip your your core. Um, Again, we already just talked about how that is not something really new, but to elevated attention to it. So what are some things that we're trying in that space may may be new or unique that we probably didn't try in the past to actually equip our core? Yeah, you know, um, we really realized that there was a great opportunity to kind of re-infuse our culture and our DNA and even have some theological conversations with our core. So what we did at the beginning of the year, when it was still winter and we were still, you know, not sure if we could meet, we created these videos called reset videos. They're about 10, 15 minute videos with Andy. And we get to cover some of the conversations that we would want to sit down with volunteers over coffee and really unpack like, Things like what does love require of me and and what are the five faith catalysts and how do they impact your faith journey? And, you know, what is our approach to evangelism and discipleship? And so we got to make some videos um, into self-directed content, which that's a little bit of new space for us. So we allow volunteers to consume it on their own time. And then we would schedule, you know, some huddles or some meetings or something like that to unpack as volunteer teams. And so that's been a great learning. And we are going to continue to integrate that into the long-term process. So as soon as a volunteer is new, they just, they bump into that kind of information and and understand what our heartbeat and and how we do things um, through a theological and, you know, even executionary lens. So that is definitely something we're going to continue. In the summer, we're going to try something new. We um, feel like we're pretty good at going over the hard skills. You know, we're, we've been doing that for a long time with volunteers, you know, put out the goldfish, facilitate this way, you know, don't let that group member talk too long. But we really wanted just to provide some content and conversations exclusively for them and their own personal relationship with Jesus. So we're, we made a, a couple of sessions that we're calling Equip and uh, same idea, self-directed content. They can consume it on their time, but we're going to offer up some sessions where they can just unpack it with some like-minded volunteers. And really, we just want something for them just to, for them to have a, an intentional moment about their own spiritual growth. Mm, that's so great. I'm excited to see that roll out. So Holly, when we talk about getting practical, there's always, you know, there's the, what are we actually doing? But then there's the bigger question of we've aligned our, we've come up with a new strategy and, um, you know, if we don't align our staffing and our dollars to that new strategy, it probably isn't going to stick. 
So love to get super practical with our leaders today. Um, and just really talking first about the staffing, how, um, how, do, how did you go about that? When we, you know, you set out to create this whole new strategy, there's these three ideas, but we had our staff that was focused on something completely different, primarily Sunday morning execution prior, um, prior to this. So how have you rethought about the staffing in general? Um, and, you know, just even talking about, did we hire a bunch of new positions? Did we redeploy? Just kind of give us an overview of how you were thinking about the staffing to support this new initiative. No, well, Rhonda, you're so right. You have to move the staff and the dollars or this or the thing doesn't come to life. And that's where the rubber meets the road. And that's really hard. And I can tell you, I've been through a couple different iterations. So um, <laughs> be, be encouraged, you know, that you're probably not going to get it right the first time, but that's okay. You yes. got to learn and course correct. You know, one thing we tried at first was, was thinking, okay, maybe we should put them in these three different buckets. But we found out this strategy is much too dynamic for that. You know, there are some parts, um, some staff members that will major on some of it, like, let me give you an example. The groups team will probably major on the equipping and they are definitely gonna inspire their audience through a good group experience. But those endearment efforts I was telling you about earlier, those are primarily left uh, to other teams and to some other players. Not that that team doesn't care about it. Of course they do. Um, they will probably contribute a couple times a year. But that's kind of what we learned is all three of them, they're going to cut through every department, but you're going to kind of major or minor on some different things. So we had to kind of feel that out for a minute and help people get clear on that. Um, but we also created some positions that did not exist before. Mm -hmm. And we did not do that by adding headcount because we're, you know, just like you and, and probably lots of other places out there, we had to redeploy and yeah. shift some roles. So some things, some roles that exist now that didn't a year ago are uh, a digital content role because we wanted to get serious about uh, meeting people, you know, in that space. Uh, young adults, again, like I said, that was a hold yeah. for us. Um, we have a next steps team. Formerly, we had had a group launch team or group link, sorry, group link team. We had done a big event. And right before COVID, we were shifting away from that. We were going to more of a digital landing page launch type um, which was creating, it was opening up some positions. So we kind of redeployed some of those. Um, and we now have a next steps director. And I'm, I'll tell you a little bit about our, our concierge thinking in a minute. Um, we also have a public relations person. So she um, works with the community. We want people to be aware that North Point is here. And so part of her job, she pitches in on lots of projects, but primarily she helps um, connect the dots for the community of when book drives and things like that are happening. So none of those things existed before and we took existing players uh, if they would fit the new criteria and kind of shift some folks around. That makes so much sense. Um, talk to us a little bit about this concierge approach, this next, mm -hmm. the next steps director and what, what does that look like on a Sunday morning? And then I guess I'll, I'll stop there and ask you another question in a second. Okay, well, we're definitely trying to figure that out. Uh, our heartbeat is that we really want everybody to feel really personal. We want there to be personalized pathways, you know, for everyone that walks in the door, no matter where you are on the journey, that there could be multiple next small steps that would feel appropriate for you. I think what we learned in the past was, um, well, we learned this and, you know, our data showed it is if people come in within the, in the first four months, if they take a step, they serve, they group, they give, I mean, they are in like, they're like, I love what y'all are doing. Let's go. But for the people who didn't, which was a lot of people, uh, the steps were just too large because the commitments were too long. And so we decided we want people to be able to integrate so much easier. So that's not what our, our director of next steps thinks about. She meets uh, them in the studio. If they're willing, whoever shows up physically, we, we say it from stage every Sunday, hey, if you're here, we'd love to meet you in our connection space. And we invite them to come in and have a conversation. We invite them online to fill out the I'm new form. And then from there, they would connect with my friend Jane, who is the director of Next Steps. And she looks at every individual and asks them a couple of questions, this grid we created, so that she could serve them up a really intentional next step. That is so, so that's great. What I'm yeah, yeah, we'll see. We, we want to keep refining that process. Yeah. And to your point, it's new. Um, we don't necessarily have like years of data to support it yet. Um, so the likely there will be some tweaks along the way and um, some changes. And if it's not working, we'll 
try to figure out something else that's that hope, we hope would work. So I love that we're just always kind of thinking that direction of, you know, try it and see and evaluate. So I think that, is, in fact, that's one of our phrases around here, right? Orchestrate and evaluate, orchestrate and evaluate. And when the evaluate shows us something else, we pivot and orchestrate something new. So that's right. Not afraid to iterate, which is such a freeing process. Yeah. You know, you can just learn from your, you know, when you skin your knees, you can learn. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right. So let's move over to the budget then. Um, you know, again, we talked about staffing a little bit, realigning some staffing around these new ideas. But now what about the budget? I know you're just uh, recently wrapped up kind of our budget season and or maybe are still wrapping that up and clarifying. But what does that look like for you moving into this next season? Where have you moved dollars to? And uh, maybe even you know talk about where did you pull those dollars from? Yeah, yeah, great question. Because this is a really, really important part of the process. And I'm glad we are doing it a year later because we really spent the year kind of learning and seeing if yeah. what we thought would work would work. Um, so basically we did, we spent all last week with the leadership team and we put a list of the opportunities that we learned from the last year. Here's what we learned. Here's what was good. Here's what we want to keep chasing right beside it. Next column, a list of our trade-offs. So opportunities and trade-offs because you cannot do both. And even if you could afford to do both, I don't think it's a good idea so because wise. you don't put your best energy yeah. into the new things. And then you don't really set it up for success. So this season, we are really saying, hey, our yes is going to be yes, and our no is going to be no, and these are the things we're going to go after in this season, and then we're going to learn and evaluate, um, because it is always tempting, temp tempting, you know, with 25 years of muscle memory to kind of want to mix and match or even slide back in, but so we're, we're trying to be really disciplined in this season to move those dollars and to do the things that we think um, are the best things to do right now. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned the muscle memory. So I just would love to go like in terms of implementing all these changes in terms of, you know, uh, rolling out the strategy to the staff, getting them to embrace it, and then, you know, shifting staff and shifting dollars around it to all support it. But you mentioned um, the muscle memory and, and change is just hard, right? Change is hard for all of us. And I would imagine it was easier to talk about some of these things when it was when we weren't back in the building on Sunday mornings. And then the buildings open back up and that muscle memory kicks into place and we all want to go back and do it the way we used to do it. And, you know, that, and to focus on the things that we used to focus because they were good things. So talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, how did you roll out the embracing of all of these ideas to the staff? And, you know, just tell us a little bit about how that went. Yeah, well, I echo your sentiment that change is very hard, even with, I feel like we have the sharpest people and they're just so mission-minded. It's still just, it's hard because you don't totally know what you're moving to and you don't know if your idea is going to totally work. And um, so a couple of things, I mean, oh, gosh, I feel like I've learned so much and it's been hard. I think two things, you have to over-communicate more than you even think is po needed or possible, you know, because, um, when you're tired of hearing it, when they're actually tired of hearing it, I think is when you're starting to get it right. So we really dedicated a lot of staff time to that at the beginning of the year. You know, we went through our reset principles again. We went through the language. We shared stories and examples almost to the point where I think they were like, okay, we're ready for staff meeting to change up, you know? Um, so that was one part of it. Really enlisting the leadership team's help. You know, they, I really give them a lot of credit for pushing this down so well. And, you know, it was hard. And at the beginning, um, as they began to feel some of the pushback, one thing that we did as a team is we drafted a, a bunch of scenarios of, you know, how you hear all the things in the hallway about, oh, this is hard. And why did we, and I'm not sure I drafted bunch of those scenarios together and we pulled them out of a hat one day during a leadership team meeting and we just practiced vision casting and then we would give each other feedback you know one affirmation of like hey you really nailed that part and one challenge of how they can make it better because this team is so responsible for just pushing it down to the layers and leading the people underneath them and so I found that to be a really critical component not one person can do change it is a complete team effort um, and I think another thing is um, for us, we're a multi-campus organization. So lots of layers and um, 
directions. And so I've had to be really diligent of looping in key stakeholders in a timely fashion. And so every few weeks, I try to send out an email that's kind of like, hey, we just came up with our equipping plan for the summer. Here's what we're thinking, you know, and just keep that vision really fresh. So the moment that we've kind of decided and landed on something that is key to the strategy, I try to disseminate that information internally. That's so, so helpful and wise. Um, That's great. Were there any particular barriers that you ran up against um, in particular with the staff as you were rolling it out? Um, I I think it's just kind of the normal, um, people don't know how to win in a new role when it's brand new. And so that kind of temptation to make sure, you know, they want to succeed. um, and, And I think you just have to keep encouraging them of like, Hey, leaders take risks. Leaders lead out. It's okay if you mess up. Like you will help us all learn. And and just empowering them. You've been unleashed to figure this out. You're not alone. We're doing it together. And really, I just think it's that kind of constant coaching when they hit their own personal barriers. Or, you know, sometimes they'll bring something to a a team meeting and it's like, hey, the staff aren't really. And instead of getting irritated, because it's hard, I'll say it's hard for me. When you've been thinking about something for so long, I've probably been thinking about this the longest, you know, and it's so kind of in me and I know it. And to be like, what? why don't you get this? Like, come on, just get on board. Like, let's go. And if, if people on the ground are starting, you know, if they're kind of struggling, getting the vision, well, that's just a cue to you as a leader of like, all right, well, it's time to revisit it, to make it more compelling or to listen to what they're bringing up, because maybe there's somewhere that you're off. So those have just been the things that I think just the normal growing pains of change. Yeah, absolutely. And just the reminder of why leadership is so important in those moments to just lead through and keep pressing through. And, and I love your, um, your uh, attention to listening because it's so important. There may be a key, key element that was overlooked. And so it's important to understand what the barriers are, what the pushback is and to create and craft strategies around addressing those if necessary or adapting if necessary as well. I have learned that those criticisms or pushbacks, whatever you want to call it, has made everything so much sharper. And so I'm so, that has been probably one of the biggest learning lessons um, this year. So I'm so glad that we have a team that's kind of embraced that because it's not always fun. Yeah, it is worth it. (laughs) Worthwhile, <laughs> yeah. not fun, but worthwhile. You're so right. Yeah. Well, Holly, in just a minute, we're going to take some questions from our listeners. But before we go there, I wanted to share an opportunity um, with our listeners about some coaching that we are offering to our listeners. At um, really, the first one is at half price. Uh, you can find out more information about this at NorthPointPartners.org/coaching. And it says strategy coaching on here, and it could be about your strategy, or it could be about anything that is top of mind for you. Uh, one month um, at half price and there's no minimum. You can cancel at any time. And um, as Holly has mentioned, this you never go through strategy changes or even leadership alone. And so if you've been thinking about um, coaching at, you know, leadership coaching at any level, maybe this is the time to start um, and give it a try. 50% off and that'll be out there for a while. So you can take advantage of that. So Holly, let's go ahead and tap into some of our questions from our listeners. Um, Brent, I'm sorry, Brett actually asked this question about endearing the community. After you've spent some time and energy actually endearing the community, how do you actually make that first invitation to connect to the church? Uh, Is it just a simple invitation or how would, what would you say to that? Yeah, no, great idea. Um, Great question. So yeah, those are the things that we're trying to figure out what are kind of those small little micro steps that might not be too much of a leap, but we'll we'll just help people take the next right step, the next right step. That's what we're always thinking about. You know, for digital, it's a a little bit easier, or I would say we're testing out some things, you know, like when we launch Parent Summit, we're going to follow up with some drip content before we ever invite them to anything. So we're going to continue to add value several times before we ask them to do something. And some of those things could be attend a community event like the Christmas tree lighting. It could be join a digital group if they're ready for that. Uh, It could be something we're thinking about is creating some like serving opportunity groups in the community. So even outside the walls of the church, but just to kind of give back to our local community. So we're going to try out some of those and see, you know, what keeps people stepping and uh, we'll kind of follow the path where, where they lead actually. 
Yeah, that's so great. Um, Jared Martin is asking about um, equipping the content. Uh, is the equip content for volunteers only in groups or have we um, figured out a way to offer that online? And I think you touched, touched on that a little bit earlier, but give us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so the equip content is really for anyone who is a volunteer anywhere in the house. You know, this will be a, a, something different we did. Typically, we have gotten into a little bit of our silos of training our volunteers and whatever department you're in. And we took advantage of this season to do some house kind of initiatives like every volunteer needs to hear this reset series. We think every volunteer could benefit from these equipped conversations this summer. So it's for everybody. If you serve in family ministries, if you serve in the parking lot, uh, if you serve in a group. And so we're actually going to host those um, for North Point volunteers on a website where they can get it. Uh, but I believe partners may even have an opportunity to tap into that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and Holly, are those going to be live um, gatherings or will there be some combination of some live gatherings or digital gatherings or how, what will that look like? Exactly. Combination of um, there's opportunities to come in and meet face to face and do a huddle. And then there's some Zoom huddle opportunities as well. And we're yeah. keeping them limited, you know, so that they're helpful. And yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. So for the church out there that's thinking, hey, North Point's big, they've got all kinds of staff, maybe, um, you know, what resources, whatever. And they're saying, gosh, how would I even start something like this in a smaller church? What advice would you have for them just to get yeah. started? Well, I think maybe some of the most important work we did was really defining the problem very clearly mm -hmm. because it's easy to spin off in a couple of directions. So you might say, well, I don't have a big enough staff to work with. You know, original conversations didn't necessarily begin with, you know, A, B, C, and D staff member at this campus. We really kind of pulled a collective group of people that are just strategic thinkers. They get who we are. Um, some of them were elders. Some of them were just business leaders in the community. And we started the conversations there until we got to where we could clearly define the problem. And that's kind of where we um, began to bring staff into the journey because you know what they say a, a problem well defined is half solved <laughs> so it was better to start with the strategic group of people and some people that really didn't even think like us that was super helpful so you can do that if you're a smaller church and you know one advantage to being small is being scrappy you know um sometimes having too much you don't have to say no but we found during COVID, when everything stopped, we had to get way more creative and more innovation was fostered because kind of the same old things, our old playbooks weren't working as well. So, you know, I do think that is an, an advantage, just kind of that innovation that you can tap into. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've all heard that the, the Titanic takes longer to turn than a rowboat, right? So um, yeah, imagine it took a little bit longer for us to actually come up with these ideas in a collaborative way that got buy-in across campuses and to implement it is just takes a little bit longer because we have a bunch more staff to, you know, get on board with it. So I actually, to your point, I think there is an advantage to working with a smaller church on that. Mm -hmm. um, Deb is asking, would you flesh out a little bit more the shift from group to concierge? And um, Holly, I know you did talk about that earlier a little bit. In particular, talk to us about group link like, will we do a group link in the future or um, what will that look like to do a group launch differently potentially than we've done in the past? Yeah, we started tinkering with this before pre-COVID and had a couple of quick successes with it. You know, we used to do group link in person, come to the building. You might not know anybody. It might feel like speed dating. You know, we've got mixed reviews on that. It's really hard uh, to connect a group of strangers together. And so we were doing it in person and we decided, hey, technology. People are used to this, like they check people out on Facebook. I think they're comfortable. What if we tried that? And we did before COVID and we had a lot of great success. You could go online, you could kind of customize, pick your group, see what was out there. The leader would reach out before. So you had a couple touch points, kind of like how the world works now. You have a couple digital touch points before you actually come in and meet the person. So that is what we're going to continue to do for group launch. That's what we're calling it. Uh, a couple of things that we've added since then are, are a little uh, varieties of groups. You know, we tried a three-month track that was 
pretty scripted out. Like the leaders, we, we try to take all the guesswork out of them and take them on an arc and on a journey over three months. And we had a really great response and a really great um, return rate of people wanting to keep going after that. So that is kind of a new addition of us trying to make it a little more personalized, um, a little more you know, succinct, like listening to, to feedback. So I think you'll see more of that in the future of us trying to offer some shorter steps and some different mm-hmm. steps. Yeah, that's so great. Uh, and last question here from Steve Curran. He's saying, um, you know, I love this question actually because it's so true. Um, you know, and sometimes we can say, say all the things that went well with a with a particular project that we're working on, but not everything always goes exactly as planned. And so I love this question because it just helps us be honest and vulnerable. So Holly, um, is there anything that comes to mind to you as we're rolling this out that maybe didn't go so well or didn't go as planned? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So so the first thing that comes to mind (laughs) is an idea I had that I brought to the team. And, you know, it was early on in COVID and we were just longing to be together. And so I thought, I bet there are so many people who want to just unpack Andy's sermon right after it happens. We should do Zoom huddles that night, maybe during the week and kind of just violate all the principles of group that we followed for so many years. And I think we found out why all those principles are in place. And so uh, we did it, you know, a group of us, we had the huge zoom room and the breakout facilitators. And at the end of the night, when all of us came back to kind of debrief, there was only one facilitator that was like, okay, I had a good conversation. The rest of us were like, Oh my gosh, what did we do? You know, we, um, yeah, we just had, <laughs> we violated all the rules, you know, the, it was, it, we didn't set expectations for what this would be. We had people all over the map. It was hard to control the conversation. And yeah, it just wasn't a great idea. We didn't do it again. And so <laughs> it was really good for me to, well, everyone was super gracious, but it was, it was good, you know, to see like, all right, we're going to have some ideas that are robust. Okay. Mark it off the list. Let's keep going. So that one was an easy one to pick on. Yeah, that's awesome. And honestly, just giving your staff um, freedom to fail and try things is is, um, you know, that's where the best ideas end up emerging from anyway. So I love that you did that. And thanks for sharing that example. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, as we close today, I just want to thank our listeners one more time for joining us today. And also just remind you, remind our listeners that we do have an opportunity to um, join in on some strategy coaching or actually any coaching, leadership coaching that you might be interested in. You get 50% off your first um, month of coaching. And this will all be done by uh, the coaches are North Point partner or North Point staff members, actually. And North Point partners would love to help you facilitate that conversation. So once again, Holly, um, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise and just um, sharing an inside look at what you've been working on over the last year or two. We're super appreciative of your time and sharing. Oh, well, thanks so much. I enjoyed being here. Glad to be on the journey with all of you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Holly. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Sounds great.